pop quiz. Does insulation keep you warm or does insulation work to keep you cool? Well, if you're struggling to get that answer, you've come to the right place. Hello, my name is Mike. I am the owner of Spray Jones, which is a contracting firm in Canada. We spray foam insulation. I've been doing that for 20 years. And if we stick around in this video, you're gonna find out why so many insulations aren't actually doing its job. So let's get into it. Okay, I'm gonna give you four points on exactly what insulation is and how it works today. The fourth is a real banger, but don't worry, it's not in any of that inside jargon crap that nobody understands. I don't understand the words you just said. So I'm gonna walk you through it easily and quickly, and therefore, you're gonna sound like an expert on the other end. If you're in the spray foam biz where you install it or you have to receive it, spec it, or inspect it, I want you to join my online community called thinksprayfoam.com. In the description of this video will be the link. Go there, click, join. The reason being is that you can have an at all conversation about spray foam with people that care, me and others, without all the trolls, without all the mess. There's lots of information in there. Plus, it helps support the work of these videos and furthering the industry ahead. All right, use this one at your next cocktail party. Insulation is just a material, forget what type, but just a material at this point to resist heat flow. What is heat flow? Remember your physics class? It is high energy, dissipating to low energy. So when something is hot, the molecules are excited and they're giving off energy and that is what we have is heat. Energy is going to dissipate to the molecules that aren't excited on the low side. That's dissipation. It's going to go from high to low until it equalizes and balances everything out just like a teeter-totter. So what are the four me or three mechanisms of heat loss? One, conduction through First, touching. You're physically up against something. You're touching it. The high energy dissipates to the low energy. It's always from hot to cold. Second, convection. Ooh, the air. It's blowing. Wind. Air is moving or convection current is dealing with the surrounding surfaces. It's giving off air movement. The air is picking up the heat from high energy to low energy, and that is your convective movement. Third, final, is radiation. Think of energy coming through sunlight through a window. You feel the direct impact of the radiating heat coming from high to low. Most insulations are a material because we can't just have blank airspace because blank airspace will allow the convective current to be unimpeded, meaning the molecules will excite the next molecule and there's just nothing to break down them daisy chaining and going from one side of the box to the other side of the box. So an empty box in theory has insulation, but we need to impede the flow. So we're putting something inside that box, which is gonna break up the pathways of high energy to low energy dissipation. Now, the insulation material should be able to handle all three, conductive, convective, and radiant but very few, if at all, ever handle all three. In fact, most of them are only gonna handle one, and we're gonna get into why that's so bad. So in the early days of insulation, when they realized that they needed to impede the flow of heat, they used horsehair, wood chips, newspaper, because all of these products are just a medium material that is going to provide impediment to the conductive qualities and convective qualities of the heat flow of high energy to low energy. If you fast forward into modern or so-called modern materials, the entire industry of spun glass fiber and spun lava rock fibers are just a old way of getting results nowadays. So rather than using horsehair, wood chips, newspapers, we're going to spin this product into a fibrous format. We're going to then prepackage it into a bundle that you can then either cut and form and place into the walls. That's a type of trying to have the media material dead airspace. Second is to use a cellular plastic of some sort, and you're gonna create gaps and voids in the plastic. You're not gonna use a lava rock or a spun glass you're not going to use horsehair, wood chips, or straw. You're going to use plastics that are going to then be cellularized. So they've got all these honeycomb of pockets. The pockets are either going to contain an inert gas inside of them, and that's going to provide the impediment to heat flow. All of these products are forced with the same issue. They need to be cut and formed. They're pre-established in a factory. They need to be cut and formed and placed into the wall, the roof, up against concrete, the building materials. And that's where the major problem 
problem lies. How are these products, whatever you're going to use, how are they going to be fastened to the building and lay in up against and around and surround the areas that need insulation in the first place? So we've got our insulation media material. We're either going to use a fiber, a mineral fiber, or a spun glass fiber, or we're going to use a rigid cellular plastic. These are our general options. The issue is that we can't let air blow through our insulation because air is convection. Air is a draft. Air means we're cold. Air means the pipes freeze. So the air can't go through the fibrous. It shouldn't be going through the mineral fiber. It shouldn't be going through the rigid cellular plastic, and it shouldn't be going around it. Secondly, we want the insulation material that we're choosing to be up against our building. We don't want it in the truck. We don't want it laying on the job site. We want it up against the substrate of what we're trying, our wall, our roof, our floor, our foundation, whatever is the framing, the box that we are creating. I use that as a generic term, box. What is the separation between inside and outside? What are we trying to insulate? What are we trying to isolate? So the insulation shouldn't be susceptible to gravity. It doesn't want to fall out. It doesn't want to slump sag. We want it to be in actual contact with the substrate because being just a little bit away from it has a detrimental effect on how well the overall insulation is going to work. We don't want air going through it. Air carries moisture in the form of relative humidity, so we don't want air blowing through the insulation or around it and cheating and getting on it. And if we take those care of those first two, the convective and the conductive, then radiant really doesn't become a big problem because all of a sudden the surface isn't getting extremely warm and radiating the heat and transferring it over. So if we can control convective and conductive and we don't allow air to go through it and we don't allow it to fall away from the substrate, all of a sudden we've got a very good insulation material and it's probably going to work. Now you're starting to see why something like sprayed polyurethane foam insulation ticks all the boxes. So extruded polystyrene is a cellular foam plastic that has a blowing agent trapped in the cells. Likewise, you can be using polyisoboard, using a polyurethane foam that's got some foil on it. All of these products are very good insulators. The problem is the seams. It, the problem is the edges. And then the major problem is how these products are going to be fastened to the wall, to the roof, because the building construction is never atypical. Well, it's usually atypical. It's not typical. You're not dealing with flat, even. You're dealing with this thing, that thing, this intersects over here. This is in my way. This is a supporting piece. This can't be cut. When you are dealing with construction, residential, institutional, agricultural, all of these types, you're dealing with the supporting structure, making the box, making the frame, making the thing, making the dome, and then figuring out how on earth you're going to separate inside to outside, warm to cold, and it has to fit tight, and it has to be in intimate contact because gaps form areas for moisture. Air can get into them. Air carries moisture in the form of relative humidity. Hot air, meaning cold substrates, means that you have condensation. Condensation means you have moisture. Moisture buildup between the wall, the roof, the assemblies leads to building decay. So what do we need to do? We need to have a insulation that doesn't flow air through it, doesn't allow water to flow through it. That means we immediately get rid of the cellular open cell products. We want to go to a plastic because plastic doesn't flow air through it and water through it. But then how are we going to get it to be adhered to the thing that we've built? How do we fasten it? And are the fastening devices going to be a problem? Problem. nails, screws. Those are areas that we've punched holes through our insulation. Those are areas that can't be insulated. Those are areas that now are what we call a thermal short. So thermally, it's a shortcut to get cold. Metal is highly conductive. So if I've gone and spent all this time to put a cellular plastic on, and then I punch it full of nails, those nails could end up condensing, dripping, getting freezing cold, causing problems with my wall, with my roof. Not to mention that cellular plastic a lot of times just doesn't want to shape and form just like taking wallpaper and trying to put it in a room that's an oddball shape and size very time consuming very frustrating to get that into place what if there was a product that you actually could not have fasteners not have gaps be cellular plastic self-adhered aha i think i know of something i think spray foam will answer that question this is why i'm so passionate about spray foam insulation because after you've listened this far 11 minutes into this video you're starting to see that you need to take care of air movement water movement you need to be adhered to the substrate the questions on radiant have already been answered what if there was a self-adhering cellular plastic that you could customize on site liquid applied well that's what spray foam is it is actually being mixed and made right at the gunhead 
on the substrate. We're spraying a liquid on that rises and sets in seconds. So the rising effect is it's pressing into the substrate, it's pressing into the cracks, into the crevices, into the corners, and it's filling all of those things as it's rising. The rising is key because it's forming the cellular network. The cell network then has gas trapped inside of it. That means we've now created our convective and conductive barrier. And the plastic itself doesn't let water go through it, doesn't let air go through it. So now we have an air impermeable, water impermeable, insulation, isolating material that is custom molded, liquid applied to the substrate, self-adhering, and it's glue. It's stuck to it. Now you can start to see that if we build with wood, brick, concrete, metal, these materials are easily bonded together and the spray foam sticks to all of them. This is why this is the insulation of tomorrow. No longer are we trying to do prefabricated materials that have messy fasteners, weak spots. It's not susceptible to air and moisture, and you're not trying to use secondary and third rate products in addition to it to get it to do its job. Spray foam is a standalone product. Air don't go through it, water don't go through it, and it's bonded and adhered. We're not having to figure out how to fasten it. What I want you to do today is join thinksprayfoam.com. This is where you can go to have these kinds of discussions about spray foam and other installations and have an adult conversation without the trolls, without all the people that are trying to tear you down and explain to you that you're no good. This is where you're gonna get support and help at thinksprayfoam.com.